Welcome to Recovering Love Church. Those of you who are with us here today in this room, as well as those um, who are joining us virtually, we um, are glad that you're here. My name is Deb Tron. Tonight, the women of Recovering Love Church are, have been asked to kind of come together and um, be a witness to the good work that God is doing um, among us, um, within each of us, as well as as a group. So we ask that you set your minds at ease, that you would listen with your heart to what maybe God is saying to you tonight. Maybe you're being called. Maybe he um, is wanting to move you in a, in a way, in a new way. May you feel God's love and compassion for yourself for this evening. This month of August, our, um, we are in our eighth step, um, and we look at the principles um, of each step, and this month is compassion. And if you would just read along with me um, the scripture reading from 1 Peter. Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted, keep a humble attitude, don't repay evil for evil, don't retaliate with insult, when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. So along with um, looking at the principle each month um, that goes along with our step, we like to look at a practice, a practical practice, or a portable practice. Um, and that for this month is when someone offends you, don't retaliate, instead, bless them. So if you would just bow, I'll say a prayer for all of us as we enter into the evening. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our hearts. We want to see you. We want to experience you. Make us a compassionate people. We want to carry your light into the dark places. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you. Enjoy the evening. Well, again, my thanks to the women of RLC who either chose or gave their approval to all the music tonight. Uh, they chose a good one to open with. I invite you to stand as we sing Open the Eyes of My Heart. Two, three, four. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 to see you high and lifted up, shining in the 
in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. As we sing, as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. seated. Hi, my name is Linda, and I'm going to share a little bit about compassion and what it means in my life. Um, I'm going to start with a verse, Psalm 103.8. He is compassionate and tender towards those who don't deserve it. Um, on that, I looked up a lot of definitions, and one I really liked and related to was the one on the Compassion International site. Um, and this definition says, someone else's heartbreak becomes your heartbreak. And that was really touching and says it well to me. I don't know if there's any, I don't know everyone's story here, I don't know if there's anyone among you that has struggled with taking in God's love and grace and compassion. Um, like God's out there, but not personal or real for you. I remember my daughter, this is when she was about six, and she had prayed a prayer or a sinner's prayer at church, and she had no clue, I don't think, at that time what she was doing. And one day she raised her shirt, Jesus, are you in there? <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's sometimes how we feel. So I'm going to share a little bit of my story. I was a little girl some 60 plus years ago, and like my daughter, I went to Sunday school and I learned about having Jesus um, in my life. I prayed the sinner's prayer, but really, back then with my background and everything, it was presented as an insurance policy to get to heaven. And, um, uh, but looking at my background, what I was, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I'd also say that in the church, I felt like now I'm in the in-group, and probably that was the start of people-pleasing, because if, you're, if you've prayed the prayer, they're not going to come, you know, nobody's going to bother you. So looking, well, as a kid I'm talking about, looking into my background and my heritage, I would say that I grew up under a veil of, and a heritage of legalism, perfectionism, alcoholism, criticism, and um, whatever else you want to put in there. But I um, take a, I had this picture of like when you take a sand blaster and you know, you go underground or whatever, and the last thing that comes out is the ash, or if you start a fire. And what I came up with was I listed those things, but then pour the toxicity of that ash. For me, that was shame and guilt. Pour it all over all those things I said already and the message I heard in life. That was the lens that I, um, that was the lens I had to live, a, lead a life with healthy self-esteem wrong. That doesn't help in any ways. But it was a horrible way to w live. I just didn't know a different way. And I certainly didn't have the aroma of Christ or no freedom either. But as the years progressed, um, sticking in with legalism and everything, I really felt compelled to share my faith. And when I look back, I couldn't put a word on it because I even wondered had I really known God 
But then I think what I came up with is, after I listened to something is I was really like a Pharisee. Um, I was just sharing my do's and don'ts that others might want to incorporate into their new life. After all, I could certainly judge others, and um, I prided myself on doing the right thing. But as all of we know, and I think we understand, I don't know everybody's journeys, but I think by the time we look at our dysfunction, it's, we come by it honestly because it's the only thing we know. I mean, it's not like we were just going the wrong path or, you know, we were just making these poor, poor choices. But for me, shame was such a powerful companion. And um, this I saw, and it really spoke to me, because shame in my background was tagged to healthy behaviors about making choices or taking care of ourselves or giving and receiving love. There was always this piece of shame that was attached to it. If you want to know more, I can explain it, but I have to move along. It just really was. But um, in my late, I'd say, 30s, you know, I, all my systems didn't work anymore. All my things just, they just didn't work anymore. And I felt very defeated. I've had depression. And I think my isms just led me into therapy, but it was desperate. It wasn't like I just said, oh, I'm going to go to therapy tomorrow. It was really hard. But little did I know um, that God could enable me to own his great love and compassion for me. I, in the meantime, just like many of you have done for various things, I had to take some very difficult steps that... Um, didn't fit at all in line with the beliefs of my family of origin. So it was quite painful. Um, it's like I had to start over and that I was a shell of a person without all those things. Has anybody ever felt that? It really was. It was like I was a shell of a person. But the good part is that I made a discovery for myself through many different things. And I'm going to give you examples of three. I just had never heard the word grace. And sure, I'd sang Amazing Grace how many times? Um, we've, and um, before meals, I'd said grace. But I, I, um, I just didn't ever, I don't know, but I just never got it. And so I'm going to give you, this is probably in the 90s, but my life was so changed by understanding grace, and I'll give you some pieces to that. But I felt like God began to speak to me as I cleared out that old rubble and could put in some healthy things. Um, and it, it was Christmas Eve. This is probably maybe between 1991 and 93. I don't know. But we were visiting a church with a family that went there, and we were sitting in the second row. And they started, it was on Christmas Eve, it was the midnight service, and we were singing joy to the world. He rules the world with truth and grace. And it was like I'd never heard that before in that song. And I immediately just had little tears trickling down my face. And it was like I really was saying this to myself. You mean people have heard about this before? And... Um, and I looked up about that song, and it was from written in 1719. And I just thought, how could people know about the undeserved favor of God? And because I, um, I had just been trying to either accomplish things for him or just avoid things. So um, I felt like understanding this grace allowed me eventually to take in the compassion of God so that I could give it to others. Um, a second example I had is that um, we were, at the time, we were going to a church in um, the Chicago suburbs, and it was a little more hip than regular church, and it was just like this in the August. They were having different groups uh, take over the service, and it was the high school people. And uh, the guys that were playing um, the guitar and the drums had ponytails and earrings and wore shorts. Well, all of these things just didn't, 
you know, I know those sound minor now, but you're talking 1991, and if you've been raised legalistically, plus I will tell you in 2016, my son got married with a ponytail down his back. So, so I'm saying, yeah, things change. But during, this is what happened. I mean, it was like God just began to be able to get into my life and in my heart because I was open in a different way and I was willing to um, address my shame. And again, this is just in a service with high schoolers up there, but I just had these little tears. My kids were there. And I couldn't imagine that these high school kids knew that God loves them and that they weren't a disappointment to him, that no matter how they came, they could be used just as they are. So that was really a big moment in my life. And I just had a series of things like that that helped me understand God's great love for me. And again, I'm kind of taking the stand of why if you can't receive God's compassion, how can you give it out? I'm going to tell a little longer story. Um, I read it in a woman's magazine in the early 90s. I've never forgotten it. This is how much of an impact it had on me. And although I've tried to search for it on the internet, um, I haven't been able to find it. I kept it for a few years and then lost it. It's not a Christian article, and um, it's not about a man of faith, yet God used it to crystallize my understanding of how he pursues us and how he was pursuing me and in a way that only a compassionate God would and could do. So in 1986, a little background on what was what the article, who it was by a guy named Robert Fulcrum. He was more of, I mean, some of you He's not of your generation at all. But he wrote this book, All I Really Need to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. By the time my kids went to school, that was a poster up in their school, okay? So he and his girlfriend in high school, and I might miss a few things, I'm going strictly from memory, found out that they were pregnant. And the shame, I think, I don't know what their... Um, I don't know what their belief system is back then, but the shame was just too much to tell their parents. So they ended up moving to California, and they did come back to, well, I don't know the exact story, but they did get married, okay? But they decided to give up this baby for adoption. They just, it was too much shame for the families they grew up in. And it's so interesting to me because he wrote in this article about this daughter that he never stopped loving her. And he wrote that he would imagine her going to school. He would imagine her running and playing and what she might be doing on her birthday and her prom in college. Just he really, really just loved her. Well, eventually, I think he, um, the daughter was 22 or 24, and one day, he um, got a call from her, and he picked up the phone, and it was her, and he was just like, I've been waiting to hear from you. And um, it was her, and he could barely contain his excitement. He spoke a lot back then. I know he wrote several books, and he was a speaker that was kind of in demand, so um, he could hardly contain his excitement, but he went on this speaking tour. It was like three weeks later, and they would uh, agreed that he would meet um, his daughter in Seattle. Well, you know, after a busy speaking schedule, y you get on the plane, and he's thinking he's going to sleep. He could not sleep, he wrote. He just was in anticipation of what of just anything he'd find because he'd imagined his daughter. He even wrote this. I don't know how I remember this, but on he got the rental car. He's driving. He decides he's going to park three blocks or four from where he's going to meet her because he wants to walk slowly, and he wants to gather his thoughts. Well, he couldn't. He wanted to know her. He ran all three blocks. He raced up the steps at the home and rattled the front door open. There she was, his daughter. He hugged her and wouldn't let her go for a few awkward moments and said, you're beautiful. And this is the way, I mean, my journey's been a long journey to get to this place, but I feel like 
I have been able to, f through these different things and through different stories, plus growing in my faith, I believe that God's personal relationship with me is fulfilled in that way, that he is just waiting for me to um, be in relationship with him and for me to take in the love of God, which I really can now. I never thought I could. He loves me, and he wants to know me and have compassion on me. I also wrote down, do I have some problems? Yes. Do I have some of them I think are huge that you don't know about? Yes. Do I run to him every minute? No. Do I fail in my words and actions? Yes. Do I have wrong motives sometimes? Yes. So I can stand here and, um, you know, make it sound all peachy keen, but, you know, life is tough, as all of you know. But one thing that struck me is, just like I came to know that love of God being such a pursuing um, part of my life and how he longs to be in that relationship with me, I found my greatest blessings and freedoms are when I really saturate myself in the love of God. And as we talk here at recovery, love, and other churches to be involved in community and prayer, time alone with God, Bible study, all these things, because in these places, we grow, and in these places, we meet friends that have our same devotion. And so I wanted to read something that I just came across this week in my devotions. It says, and you can think about this, or be selective about what you allow into your soul. Be more careful with the thoughts that seek to take up residence in your brain. Understand the wisdom of guarding your heart and renewing your mind. It'll change your life. Breathe in God's promises and breathe out his word. Rehearse his goodness and remember your worth. You are his masterpiece. Walk with joyful, humble, bold confidence today. And I think that kind of sum, sums up what I'm trying to, what I was saying, because I love that part about, you know, when you're in, when you're in pain, we're not always selective about what we put into our soul. And another devotion that I read, I'm only going to read two sentences from it, but then this um, woman ends with 1 Thessalonians 5.13 from the message. I'm going to read that in closing. Everyone you meet today is facing this hard battle and needs courage, needs help to live in courage, needs someone to encourage with words that give strength for their battle. And here's the verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.13. Gently encourage and reach out for the exhausted, pulling them to their feet. Be patient with each person, attentive to their needs, and be careful that when you get on each other's nerves, you don't snap at each other. Look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. So those are my thoughts on love, grace, and compassion. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I think we miss opportunities to show compassion to others because we either don't see, we don't hear, or we do see and or hear, and our hearts are hardened, or we've got somewhere to be. And so our next song really kind of functions as a, as a prayer. Um, I'm going to engage in some, some meditation later. It's really a, a prayer for mindfulness that uh, we would be open uh, to the world around us and to those in need of compassion. Uh, we'll, we'll remain seated while we sing, Open My Ears That I May Hear. Open my ears that I may hear Whispers of truth so soft and clear and while the message rings in my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now on bended knee, ready to hear your will for me. Open my ears, illumine me, speak. of truth 
you have for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that will unlock and set me free. Silently now on bended knee, ready to see your will for me. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit Divine. Open my mouth and let me sing praises to you in every day. Open my heart and help me to share your love with people everywhere. Silently now on bended knee, ready to know your will for me. Open my heart, illumine me, Spirit. Sharon. Hello, everybody, and this is Tammy, and we're doing the paired reading tonight. Uh, it'll be 1 Peter 3.8.9, and as Bill sees it, uh, page 294. It seems to me the primary object of any human being is to grow as God intended, that being the nature of all growing things. Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted, and keep a humble attitude. Our search must be for what reality we can find, which includes the best definition and feeling of love that we can acquire. If the capacity of loving is in the human being, then it must surely be in his creator. Don't repay evil with evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. Help me believe that I live under the care of a loving God and that my own irrationality can be chipped away little by little. This is, I suppose, the process of growth for which we are intended. Hello, I'm Melissa and I'm an alcoholic. Hello. Hi guys. Um, so we are going to talk about compassion. This is the month of compassion for the church. And um, before we begin, I would like to just um, take a moment to pray. So if you guys don't mind um, bowing your heads and just being silent with me for a moment. <clears throat> Thank you, God, so much for bringing us all together tonight. This is such a beautiful group of people, a fellowship of your love and kindness, and please watch over all of us tonight and throughout the days as we leave this church into the world. Um, help us stay connected with you. Help us ask you for your help in every moment. Um, help us stay present so that we can understand that we do need you. Uh, we can't just run on our own will anymore. And we ask this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so um, I have a, the first slide, if you don't mind, um, is the, um, the first Peter that we were just read, um, which sounds like a really tall order um, when you are a sick person, you know, when you don't have the skills. Am I getting a lot of feedback? Um, when you don't have the tools and you're just running on self-will. So like for me, I'm just gonna start with 
what it was like um, coming in to recovery, um, I had to you know, hit a bottom like most people. And, um, and I thought that that was like the final bottom I'd probably ever hit. And then as I started growing in the program, I started realizing there's lots of little bottoms that I'm gonna hit. And um, being able to love each other as brothers and sisters, I didn't know how to do that. Um, first of all, I don't have brothers and sisters. I'm an only child, uh, <laughs> which wasn't a very big blessing, but um, maybe it was. Um, I had to, I had, I, I, I struggled the first few years of my sobriety. I did not want to be taught anything. I didn't want to listen to anything. I was, um, I was used to doing what my family had raised me to do, is just do what you know. You know, you know what you're doing. You know how to do it. Do it right. Get it done. You know, you can do anything. And that was, you know, that was great support. It helped me get to where I ended up being coming in recovery, but it, um, it ultimately it was progressively destroying me too because um, I was judging everybody and I was judging everybody because I was judging myself because I didn't have love as a kid the way that I wanted. I wanted my dad to want me like that dad wanted me. Um, I didn't have parents in a way that I thought I should. I had lots of um, resentment towards my mother for making choices she made. Um, and I was afraid of my father and I was afraid of my stepmom. So, um, and I was an only child, so I was just scared. I was just constantly scared of telling anybody about the things that were going on in my heart and in my head. So I just did what I knew how to do, which was what grandma and grandpa taught me to do or what my aunts taught me to do, which really did help me because I was a, um, I figured it out and I was really proud of myself, but deep down inside, I knew I was lacking and I knew I was missing. Um, so I'm just gonna move to the next slide, if that's okay. I've got a lot of them, a lot of slides. Uh, our real purpose to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and people about us, yeah. So that wasn't on my agenda until just like recently, last year. <laughs> I wanted to do that. <clears throat> I thought I was doing that at, in parts of my life, but um, I had no idea. Just like the last slide with the First Peter, I had no idea how to do that. Go ahead and um, the next slide. God restored all of our right minds. Um, he comes to all those who have honestly sought him. When we draw near to him, he draws closer to us. Um, it's hard to draw close to God sometimes. It's hard to feel love. It's hard to, like, I'm so used to the sadness, I'm scared of the love, you know? The love hurts, it hurts. Um, I have a friend who's, whose son's hurting, and it's, you know, uh, recovery is an ebb and flow process. You know, I just recently went through this really amazing um, spiritual journey, and it ended up in frustration, and it ended up in another bottom. And so, but those bottoms are so beautiful because that's where I break and finally stop pushing my agenda and just let God. Um, so I, I feel like my relationship with my higher power, come, I ebb and flow with it. I draw close to him, I pull away. I draw close to him, I pull away. So it's, it's this cyclical thing. But as long as I continue to practice these principles in all my affairs and work the steps and stay connected to my sponsor and my sponsee sisters and sponsor women and um, come to these gatherings of the fellowship of the spirit and things like that, the medicine is working. So um, next slide, please. So which brings me to the third step prayer. This is something that I do regularly, um, you know, in the meetings, of course, but also um, because if I'm not realigning myself, then I'm just in my own head. And so this is something that I pray often um, all throughout the day, and I will send this prayer to people too, especially when I know they're hurting, or if, even if I just think of someone in my head th that is appropriate, not probably my family who would not appreciate it, but people who would. Next slide. <clears throat> so I think that one of the biggest um, ways that has helped me um, move from a self-will life um, into a more uh, spiritual 
selfless life is praying in the morning on awakening. I've memorized this prayer. Um, and it's really, I think, really important to feel it in my heart. So to have an open heart as much as possible, not just when I'm praying, but as I'm moving throughout my day. So not just letting the words slip through my mind or my lips, but to um, really feel myself engage when I, um, when I read these words. Next slide, please. This is a continuation of that prayer. Um, asking God for inspiration, this is very humbling. You know, I don't know. Saying, I'm really getting comfortable with saying I don't know. I never used to be very comfortable with saying I don't know, but I'm getting better at it. It's to the point where I say it probably more often than not. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, we're not probably going to be inspired at all times, but intuition starts to happen. We start to have inspiration and we start to rely upon it. That is starting to show up for me. As the, it's like the vitamins. It's lifting the weights. It's the spiritual gymnastics. It's the spiritual fitness um, that's you know, doing this regularly. The morning prayer, the evening evaluations, the daily spot checking. There's a great app called My Spiritual Toolkit on your phone that I highly recommend. Um, all these things, chatting with your sponsor regularly. It's, you know, when in doubt, give them a call. Give them a text. Like, Getting rid of self-will doesn't just, like, it's, you have, I have to do something about it. I can't just think about it. I have to act. And it was really hard for me to act in, in the beginning because I didn't want to. It was too painful to want to. I mean, I wanted to, but it was too painful to go about it because my will was too strong. My, my ego was too easily damaged. I was too sad still to let that go because I, I thought if I broke, probably I, would, I wouldn't be able to be picked up. The pieces wouldn't be able to come back together. I think I just, I just wasn't ready, but that's okay. Next slide, please. So the 11-step prayer. We usually um, conclude the period of meditation with a prayer that we be shown throughout the day, whatever our next step is to be, that we've given whatever we need to take care of such problems. Um, you know, I had a problem with this at first, not praying for myself, because I'm like, I need prayer. I need to pray for myself, you know? And um, in the beginning, I think that's okay to feel that way. That's natural. Um, but as, like I said, as this time that I've been moving through my, my journey, um, I've been starting to notice that um, my feelings towards other people, especially like resentments, if, like from my mother, for example, the biggest one I had, um, was eating at my soul. And so I started praying for other people because of how it was a, my, my thoughts were affecting me. Um, so like it just, it's kind of like eating junk food. The Cheetos just stopped tasting good, if that makes sense. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so pausing and praying, I call this pause and pray. This is not in the big book. It doesn't say pause and pray, but that's what I think when I read this. As we go through our day, we pause um, and then ask. Whenever it says ask in the big book, I think that means pray. Um, thy will be done. Um, then we're in much less danger of excitement. I used to think excitement was a good thing. No, I can't breathe when I'm overly excited. I can't have the channel of my higher power when I'm overly excited. I get easily overwhelmed. I'm a highly sensitive person. <clears throat> so excitement, not, I want to be just able to listen and breathe while I'm listening. And excitement isn't for me anymore. <clears throat> Fear, anger, worry, self-pity, foolish decisions. Man, I don't know if you guys can relate to foolish decisions, but those used to be fun. Um, ex being exhausted from all of that. There's a lot more energy and I can be a lot more useful when I have the energy from not making the mistakes. So pausing and praying, it w prayer was not easy for me either. I didn't, I'm like, what do I say to him? What do I say to it, the energy? Hi. This is hard. Help, I guess. You know, I didn't want the help in the beginning, but as I got sick and tired of eating the Cheetos, the mental Cheetos, I started to want the vegetables. Um, next slide, please. So it works. It really does. Um, faith without works is dead. So that's a Bible verse. That is from James 2, I believe. <clears throat> the book of James, actually, I don't know if you guys knew this, but the book of James was the whole, I think, um, 
kind of message behind the big book. It was, I think they wanted to be called the James Gang or something like that, which I thought was pretty cool. It's a very small chapter in the book, but it's a very powerful chapter. Um, but anyway, Faith Without Works is dead. So the, the whole next chapter after this information in the, eight, in the 80 pages is um, of the big book is about how to apply it. So applying these principles without works is just wishing. And so for me, for being someone who I'm, I'm easily overwhelmed, I can't do this without God. I, can't, I would not be up here today if I didn't have God. I'm scared crapless of being up here. You might think I'm like calm and collected. I am not. I'm sweating. Um, my palms are sweaty. I've been thinking about this for a month. Um, it's been awful. I'm so excited to be done with this. But, um, <laughs> um, but I felt called to do it. And, you know, you, I answer the calls now. You know, I don't want to stand up here and talk to people as they walk through because I can barely make eye contact with people. Honestly, I mean, I would rather be talking with my glasses off, but I want to see you guys now because I want to start pushing myself in the ways that I know God wants me to. And so I'm doing it. I'm doing the scary things, but I'm doing the scary things that I know God wants me to do. I can, I'm starting to get the gift and grace of discernment, which is a really beautiful gift. Next slide, please. So just as the, yeah, this is the, the verse that I was talking about. Just as the body is dead without breath, also, so also faith is dead without good works. So um, one of the biggest things that I've read lately in a book called Untethered Soul is how open hearts and closed hearts are so powerful um, when it comes to hearing God or acting out of self-will. So um, in closing, I guess I'd just really like to, to express how powerful it has been um, understanding that my thoughts aren't me and that um, I'm noticing more and more as I keep myself present, like keeping myself present has been really important to me lately so that I can be aware of when something triggers a closed, a closed heart for me like when um, something comes at me that I don't approve of or that scares me or that like just sends me into a place of resistance. Um, and instead of pushing it away and being rigid towards it, I, I, I see that and I, and I feel that feeling in my heart that is closed off and, and, and I say to myself, it's okay. And I take a deep breath. Because typically, that you know, my body's ready to fight or fly, and so that's that whole pausing, practice awareness until spirit emerges. That's that whole pausing thing, and then just allow it, because everything has a beginning, middle, and an end, and it will pass through me, and it's not permanent, and it's not going to hurt me, because I do have God with me, even though I can't entirely feel His love and grace all the time. It, it's slowly coming. So um, I invite you all to keep your heart open as much as you can and notice when you become rigid. Notice when you um, are closed off to the sunlight of the spirit because that is where compassion really rests in our heart is in an open heart. Um, to be able to witness the um, heartbreaking agony of someone else, like Linda was saying, I believe the definition was of compassion. Um, that is the most beautiful gift in the world, I think, is to be able to understand that when someone's coming at me with painful words or behavior, it's not about me. And like when my mom treated me the way she treated me as a, a kid, that had nothing to do with me. Um, and to be able to witness the agony of someone else's heart and to feel the grace that's been given to me through practicing my principles um, and feeling the grace that God's given me and healing my heart from my life and then be able to give that to somebody else in just a tender heart, a gentle, tender heart. Um, it is definitely the gift of grace and mercy from God. So with that, I'm going to um, gently guide us into a meditation for a few minutes. So get it comfortable in your chair. Meditation is sometimes scary for people. Um, like prayer can be also scary, but it's really um, just sitting in, um, just imagine yourself, close your eyes, just get yourself in a nice comfort, you can slouch, you know, do whatever feels good right now. 
and just start to feel the air on your skin. Notice the seat beneath your bottom. And notice the feet on the floor, however they may be laying, however your toes feel in your shoes. Notice your hands, how they're resting. Notice the hairs on your head, how they may feel in the wind of the room. How does the air smell? Does it feel cool? Is your tongue on the roof of your mouth? Gently let it fall. Let your jaw soften. Let your neck soften. Take a deep inhale breath. And exhale, soften. Feel your belly rise as you inhale and fall as you exhale. If a thought comes, let it pass by like a cloud. And then move back to the feeling of your breath. Inhale, belly rising. Exhale, belly falling. And take another deep inhale breath and gently open your eyes. Feel the light come back into your eyes. Reposition yourself if you'd like. Stretch if you'd like. And thank you for letting me share. Julie's going to keep you going with this vibe, so take it away, Julie. I bet there's something you'd like to share with God. I bet that there's something that you want to hear from God. So this is our chance. We can speak it out loud, frightening that it is, but you can. Uh, Linda will be going around. All you need to do if you've got a prayer that you would like to say, if you have a scripture that you would like to read, share it with us. We are among friends. Just raise your hand, stay seated, and Linda will bring the microphone to you. And if you're at home, close your eyes and continue to pray to your Lord or you can send information via chat. Feel free to begin now, our special time with God together. I, pr I pray that um, 
and ask for prayers for my son who has recently relapsed and uh, feels very ashamed. So my prayer is that he's able to release himself from the shame and get back um, into uh, the state of grace mm -hmm. and come back stronger than ever, recommit and um, live the, the life of joy that he deserves. Amen. Isaiah 42, 16. But I'll take the hand of those who don't know the way, who can't see where they're going. I'll be a personal guide to them, directing them through unknown country. I'll be right there to show them what road to take, make sure they don't fall into the ditch. These are the things I'll be doing for them, sticking with them, not leaving them for a minute. Thank you, God. Dear Lord, I just want to uh, thank you for your beautiful boy, Jack, who uh, overdosed a couple of weeks ago. And uh, just thank you for the opportunity to work with him and, and know him. And uh, I just pray for his uh, wonderful girlfriend, Amy, that you'd be with her and all the rest of the people who are, are hurting as we miss this innocent young man who is uh, enjoying your comfort right now. I just trust that, God. But help us to uh, keep him and his family in our thoughts and prayers, God, and I just thank you for the opportunity to know him. Amen. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for bringing us all here today. And I want to thank you for having an open heart to hear the message that was spoken today. Um, I also want to pray for Danny, um, who joined you a little less than a week ago, and was a reminder, you know, again, like Jack, that, um, you know, this addiction is a, it's a dangerous thing. And the only thing that, that I found that's more powerful than addiction is a relationship with you. Um, so I ask for comfort for Danny's family and for all of those who have lost loved ones due to addiction. Um, I also want to pray for um, this upcoming school year, um, going back to teaching after a year off, and I pray that uh, you know, I can be a light to those I interact with and ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Oh, dear Father, I thank you. Um, you promised in Psalm 86 that um, you, O oh Lord, are a God of compassion and mercy. You're slow to anger, and you're filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. And Lord, I too, I just um, wanted to ask your um, compassion and your mercy to be with, and your comfort with our dear sister, Diane Mavis, who lost her mother on a Friday morning. So I just pray that um, as a body, we would be there to uh, comfort and be supportive. And I know there's lots of other um, suffering and wounds, but we, we know, God, that you know it, and you are, as you promised, you're a God who, um, who is always with us. And I, too, I thank you that in Isaiah 63, you said that in all our suffering, you also suffer, and you personally come to rescue us, and the angel of your presence is what saves us.
Bob, Father, I pray that the name of Jesus Christ would be precious to us, that you would be sweet to us. Lord, the end of this addiction is jails, institutions, and death. And so many of us have come so close or, or even been involved in jails and institutions. And even as we've heard tonight, some of us have had those who have, who have gone ahead of, of us already. Lord, help us to declare with our lips that what we believe in our hearts about Jesus. Help us to share the good news with other people who are in hurt or in pain. Help us to share the love of Christ. I know it's uncomfortable. It's, it's not politically correct. It's not socially acceptable. But it's the, you said you were the life, the way, the, and the truth. And Lord, that's what I'm banking eternity on. And I just want to say that in all humility, Lord, that I want to come to you and, and I want to be able to grab on to you and I want to grab on with faith. And I want you to be our great comforter, Lord. I want you to be the, the father of mercies and the God of all comfort to our church. I want us to be able to feel your love for us. I just pray that we would really feel your love and compassion so that we could share that love and compassion with other people. And I pray for those who have disappeared, Lord and are missing. Lord, that you would comfort Andy, whose friend has disappeared, and that you would bring his friend back, and that you would give us hearts for those who suffer, that we could comfort those with the comfort which we have received. Jesus, make us a compassionate church. Help us to be a compassionate people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your prayers said in silence or spoken. And I will close with this. Oh God, we don't have anything to bring to you. We don't have anything to bring but our needs and a tiny little gift of gratitude. We're glad to know that you're pleased to have us come to you with our needs and our sins. Like David said, reveal your love to us so clearly that our love just grows in our hearts and that we may learn to love you more. So Lord, I say this quite a lot. Jim said this last week, and I say on behalf of all of us, we know that you're doing great things this week. Please, God, would you show us how we can be a part of what you're doing? We invite you to live your life with us, your life in us, your life through us and your life as us. And now join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us not trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And in gratitude, we will be passing the basket as we have an opportunity to do so. And as that's going around, I'll be sharing a song that really focuses on one of the most powerful examples of compassion in the Bible, if you ask me, the parable of the prodigal son. And how deep is your compassion? And how high your mercy? And how wide are your loving arms that surround even me? Like my brother, I was restless and feeling my wild thoughts again. So I took what belonged to me and left my family. I did not know them. And how My father's love for me was calling, come back home. How deep is your compassion? How high your mercy? How wide? saw me from a distance He'd been waiting all the while for me I heard him call my name and through my tears of shame I could finally see And how deep is your How high your mercy, how wide are your loving arms that surround, surround even me. I invite you to stand as we close with Mighty to Save. Can move the mountain.
mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now. Wow, thank you everybody. Thank you, thank you for being here and helping us to um, celebrate compassion. Linda, thank you especially for your message and Melissa and everybody that shared. So we also wanna encourage you to stick around. There are treats out there and also we have the whiteboard. So please, any needs you have, we'd like to be a community of compassion. So um, if you would all join me then in our prayer this month, our prayer of compassion. O oh, gracious God, enlarge my heart with memories of ways you have shown love, mercy, and compassion towards me. Open and soften my heart as I recall those I have harmed and seek to heal what I have broken in them and in our relationship. Make me aware of how much you love those I have harmed. Help me to do your will in all the ways I relate to others. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. And then on behalf of all the women of Recovering Love, we thank you for joining us tonight. And we'd like to all, um, well, I'd also, yeah, come on up. Um, just another, we have our portable practice. And so this um, week, we encourage you to, when someone offends you, don't retaliate, instead, bless them. So as we finish all of our services, we'd like to do our final um, benediction, which is, we are powerless over the fact that God loves us and God's love for us is unmanageable. 
Thanks Peace. For yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. Team effort.